On today's show, we'll talk about why Miami's pursuit of a superstar seems more unlikely than ever, plus why Donovan Mitchell seems unlikely to ever play in Miami, and the latest on the NBA's investigation into the 76ers signing P.J. Tucker. All of that and much more coming up on today's Locked on Heat. You are Locked on Heat, your daily Miami Heat podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Heat Nation. It's a Friday edition of Locked On Heat, your daily podcast covering all things Miami Heat. However, you may be listening or watching on YouTube, Odyssey, or on your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for making us your first listen every day. I'm David Ramil, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Wes Goldberg. Uh, with Heat Training Camp just a few days away, we'll be ramping up our coverage, asking the big questions you need answers to. So make sure to be on the lookout for that next week. And of course, make sure to subscribe to the show to ensure you get everything you need every day. But today's show will be about the latest around the NBA, including NBA Commissioner Adam Silver speaking about P.J. Tucker joining the Sixers, Donovan Mitchell arriving in Cleveland. But we'll start off today's show with a concern that many of you expressed, which is when will the Heat trade for a superstar? Because, of course, they whiffed on their acquisition of Kevin Durant, Mitchell now a Cavalier. And so who's the next superstar that Miami will be able to pry loose? Well, a piece that came out today in the Miami Herald, or rather on Thursday in the Miami Herald from Barry Jackson, kind of sheds a little light on how challenging exactly that might be because there was an interesting quote from Damian Lillard of the Portland Trailblazers who recently appeared in a podcast and spoke about his loyalty again to the Portland Trailblazers. Yes, I do, began Lillard, uh, on his plan on being a blazer for life. I've had a, my share of people saying, man, you got to get out of here. You got to do this. You got to do that. But I'm the type of person that's never going to be marching to the beat of nobody else's drum. I'm going to always do what I feel is in my best interest. And I really feel at heart. I've said this on many different occasions. They call it. He's being loyal and loyalty this, loyalty that. And I'm like, I'm naturally a loyal person, but I do have a level of loyalty to the organization. But this loyalty that they're talking about is ultimately to who I am as a person. I'm being loyal to who I am and not getting beside myself because I'm somebody that I believe what I believe. Lillard went on to say that he truly thinks he can win in Portland, however unlikely that might be. So, Wes, you and I have talked about this before. It doesn't seem like a superstar is going to shake free anytime soon, but I think Lillard certainly seemed like he was at the top of the list. Now, how strongly can we take Lillard's comments as an indicator that he's going to remain a blazer for life. Because as, as always, you have to kind of take these comments with a grain of salt. Here he is being asked publicly in a podcast form, do you want to stay with Portland, the team that you just signed for and signed a huge extension with? And he says, yeah, of course, I want to be. Yeah. But we also saw Kyrie Irving say that when he was pressed, when he was a member of the Boston Celtics. And that didn't go out as well as sure. many people in Boston expected to. So what do you think? Should we take this seriously from Lillard? Is he going to remain a blazer forever? Well, first of all, Kyrie and Damian Lillard have very, very different kinds of personalities. Um, and, sure. And, sure. And, and, and when I say that, I mean, I, I do think we have to take this at face value from Damian Lillard. I believe him. I believe him, man. Um, first of all, this is the, the way stuff works in the NBA. When you have a star player such as Damian Lillard or somebody of that caliber start to yeah. demand trades and kind of put it out there through – media reports or whatever through any kinds of sourcing that he's unhappy that he may be demanding a trade soon. The reason for that is sometimes to demand a trade. The other part of it sometimes is to wrestle more control away from the organization. We saw that recently with Kevin Durant, right? Where maybe he didn't exactly want to trade, but he wanted yep. something more from Brooklyn that he wasn't getting before. Uh, and we've seen it, you know, time and time again with other star players. This already, like, the power control dynamic thing happened last summer for Damian Lillard. We got the report out there. Chris Haynes, who was really plugged in with Damian Lillard, put it out there. Then Damian Lillard comes out and refutes that. He got his coach in there and Chauncey Billups. He got his general manager in there. And they made moves over the last year to shed salary, mix things up, trading CJ McCollum, getting some picks, bringing in Jeremy Grant, adding some other guys, getting Nurkic back, and all these other things. They did all th these things to appease Damian Lillard, to mix it up, because obviously the last edition of the Damian Lillard-led Portland Trailblazers wasn't good enough. And so I, I kind of think we're done with this part of Damian Lillard. Like, 
and, and you know, like you said, take it with a grain of salt. It's the NBA. People change their minds all the time. If by the trade deadline, Damian Lillard looks around and the team's 10 games under 500, and he's like, yeah, you know what? This addition didn't work either. Let me get out of here right now. But he's had so many opportunities and better opportunities, right? Not coming off yep. of an injury year. Uh, when he was younger, still very much in the in the beginning parts of his prime. He had so many other opportunities to leave Portland. I don't really know why he would do it now. I could see him maybe leaving Portland in a couple of years if if it's just not going anywhere anytime soon. But at that point, like, I don't know how much how many more years Damian Lillard has of his prime. So in regards to the the this and now, I I do believe Damian Lillard when he says, and not just says, like his actions have like like I said, he's had multiple opportunities to demand a trade. At times people really thought it was going to happen and it has not happened yet. So I just think if it was going to happen, it would have happened already. I don't expect Damian Lillard to get moved. Maybe it was the summer. I, I maybe th this summer would have been another opportunity. But you just you see Portland rebuilding around him and seemingly having his okay on all the moves that they're making. He's in control right now. I, I see no reason for him to leave at this point. I'm absolutely in agreement with that. I can't see Lillard just changing course uh, as likely as or as possible as it could be. Like we've seen players in the past say whatever they have to publicly in order to get by. But this feels different. Like Lillard. Clearly, the leader of that organization has been there for a long time, uh, just a, a mainstay in the community. He's been so vocal about the quote unquote loyalty thing. And I know he gets mocked for it to some degree because it just seems like it's been a little bit overdone. But or he backs overblown. it up. But he does. Yeah, he really does. And, and you know what? I'm, I'm fine with that. I'd, I'd kind of like to take it into another direction where I think I think this is a, a, a maybe a growing trend or a change, perhaps, in how athletes look. Athletes are wired differently than most people in general. In order to get to the NBA, you have to be so tirelessly committed. It's a, and and not only that, but put a premium on getting better and better, doing the work and and wanting to win. You don't get to the NBA otherwise. But just this pressure that is put on athletes to win a championship in order to validate their careers. I hope we're starting to see an, the end to that yeah. because there's so many factors that go into it. And you know that I've always been you hate ranks. not anti you're anti championship. Yeah. That's fine. We got that's we right. haven't had that's an anti championship right. Right. rant from David in a while. So I'm glad we're here. It's not anti championship. Of course, I want Miami to be able to win a championship. Yeah, but it doesn't matter because that would point. drive it's it's, it's no, it's it pointless. doesn't. I don't think I, like we talked yesterday about Jimmy Butler uh, being a Hall of Famer. And I don't think he needs a championship in order to prove that like, right if he is able to at age 35 you know, pull this team together and, and get a ring. That's not necessarily yeah. what's going to be the, the convincing factor. You know, Mitch Richmond, another player that got into the Hall of Fame and a lot of people have criticized for, he put up a lot of great numbers during yeah. his career and he wound up winning a ring as like the 11th player on the Los Angeles Lakers roster. Like, does Charles that Charles Barkley isn't a worse player because he never won a championship, right? I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, championships do matter though. But um, can we, we'll, we'll talk about one other name too that Barry also mentioned, yeah. Barry Jackson mentions yeah, in this Bradley article Beale, is Bradley right. Beal. And him and, and look, you never want to paint all athletes with just one paintbrush, right? Like not every ath, not every star is eventually going to demand a trade. And in for for Damian Lillard, loyalty apparently matters. Loyalty to one organization, loyalty to one city, that matters for him. That's not right. It's not wrong. It just is what it is. That's his personality. That's how he operates. For somebody like LeBron, I think there is a bit of loyalty to Cleveland. But at the end of the day, he's just trying to win championships. He's trying to do things in Hollywood. Like he's got other things that matter to him and that's it. That's him. Right. That's fine. It's not right. It's not wrong. It just is what it is. Beal seems to be in a similar category to Damian Lillard where they do really put a value, a lot of stock into just being with one organization. Now Bradley Beal had the same comments, I think in July uh, after oh. signing the extension that I truly do believe that I can win in Washington, which of course is never going to happen. We know that, right. but Beal believes it. And that's all that matters, right? If Beal believes it, he's got he's the only player in the league with a no trade clause. If he believes it, he's not going anywhere, and it's up to him. Because if the even the if even if the Wizards try to trade him and rebuild, they can't without his consent. So um, I think in terms of the Miami Heat, right? When you're hoarding all these draft picks, when you are clearly in the star chasing game, the way that they are clearly doing. Right. then you have to make a list, right? You have to have a whiteboard somewhere in, in the offices at FTX Arena saying, what stars do we think could be available within the next calendar year? And I do think that Damian Lillard and Bradley Bill were probably somewhere on that whiteboard. You can't cross them off completely just because of these public comments, but you, you can't count on them becoming available. Like if you're the Heat and you were trying right. and you were hoping that Dame was going to request a trade before February's deadline or Bradley Beal or somebody like that, 
I don't think that you could do that. I just, I, it, not to say that it won't ever happen, but it just, it would seem like a really, a, a, a quick about face from Dame or Bradley Beal, right? Based on these comments, which you and I are in agreement. Like these are, these are honest, earnest, sincere comments from them. So to completely flip on them and demand a trade between now and February seems highly unrealistic to me. Yeah, no, I, I have to agree. Uh, I just, I'm trying to think even now as you're talking here, like who's the next name that might crop up? And, and I guess in an ideal world, it's probably Luka Doncic. And I'm sure that's going to piss off a lot of Mavericks fans if they wind up hearing this. But Zion, I like, mean, that seems, talk about, but that seems so far away, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah they don't have that kind of leverage right now. Uh, and that's the whole thing. Like there's a window to this. There's a, with Mitchell, and we'll talk about this in the next segment, it, it seems like, you know, he, he didn't want to leave Utah. He just kind of, they, they decided to to change the course of the franchise. They yeah, traded Rudy they Gobert the and they wound up trading Donovan. So it was different. If a player is going to eventually leave, like think about Chris Bosch's departure for Toronto or LeBron's departure from Cleveland. Like they were, they were in it for seven seasons. And with LeBron in particular, you know, you're you're looking at potentially one of the best players in NBA history, and that career, that resume needs to have at least one championship on it in order to validate it. Similarly to Kevin Durant, which is why he left Oklahoma City. That took seven years and you know into their career. And they left as free agents. They didn't demand trades. Absolutely. So there's a lot of things to consider there. Well, I think uh, if a couple the, other. If you're the Heat, go ahead. if you're the Heat, and we're talking about superstars available, and this is again the point of, of Barry's piece, which I think was well done. Um, was, hey, if you're the Heat, or you're a Heat fan even, and you're expecting right. the Heat to land a superstar because in Riles we trust, or whatever th sort of mantra you want to put out there, like, to your point, name the – who's coming – who is it? Name the superstar. Right. It doesn't look like it's going to be Dame. It doesn't look like it's going to be Beal. By the way, I don't think Beal is that player anyway to get Miami over the top. I think Damian Lillard could be. I'll, I'll, we've got to see what he looks like coming off of this injury this season. But after that, you know, we've talked about Shea Gilgis Alexander. A lot of people in NBA circles believe that he's going to – perhaps shake loose, maybe not in the same way of like demanding a trade, but more similar to a DeJounte Murray or Donovan Mitchell where their team says, right. you know what, he just doesn't match what it is that we're looking for right now. Let's exactly. go ahead and trade him for assets. But whatever, whatever the reason is, SGA is an all-star caliber kind of guard. Um, so you talk about him. And then after that, like it's not stars, David. It's just sort of a, it's the Miles Pro Turners. Players. It's the John Collinses yeah. who would be nice fits, but they're not stars. They're not superstars. They're not the whale that Pat Riley is chasing. I'll throw two other names at you that we don't have to explore in, in a ton of depth right now, but Pascal Siakam in Toronto. He makes a lot of sense for Miami. He does not make a ton of sense if Toronto wants to really get into the Scotty Barnes window and out of the Pascal mm. Siakam, Fred Van Vliet window. Do they, do they, mm. and by the way, they need some playing time for Scotty Barnes and OG and Nunnaby and all these guys. Like, do they try to move Siakam? There has been rumblings around the league that they, he's, he's open for business. Um, and then one other name I'll throw at you is Jonathan Isaac, right? Like you just look at Orlando's roster. I know Isaac hasn't played in two years, but he's a power forward. He would probably, if, if Miami had him, him and Bam, that would be the, the best defensive front court in the league by far. Um, and, you know, depending on what he looks like back from injury. And they've got Paolo Bencaro. They've got Franz Wagner. Like they've got Wendell Carter. They got Mo Bamba. Like there's not really room for Jonathan Isaac at this point. So those would be just two names I would just throw out there. Again, we don't have to go totally in depth about them, but... The, the thing about those names is they're not star players. They're not Damian Lillard. They're not Kevin Durant. They're not Donovan well, Mitchell. Okay, maybe not that higher echelon, but I think Siakam, I mean, as an all-NBA player, like he's still uh, – All-star player, he yeah, can consider. Sure. He'd be a great fit. Yeah, uh, I like I like him, a spicy P. Uh, Jonathan Isaac, well, let's just say I hope the Heat have no interest in acquiring him because uh, as interesting a fit as that might be, well, let's just say – the off the court interest might not mm -hmm. necessarily make him a great fit in the Miami locker room. But uh, Barry also brings up a couple other interesting tidbits here that we'll get into quickly. Uh, he just talks about the possibility of making a trade to upgrade the roster. And he debates, you know, mildly quickly uh, whether or not they should do it now or later in the season. And I think he's along the same lines as you are that this is, if a trade is going to happen, it'll probably be closer to the February trade deadline when they do acquire a role player, but again, not a superstar at this point. Uh, and then lastly, he also warns readers that their best hope for the upcoming season should be Kyle Lowry and Victor Oladipo returning to their all-star form, something uh, echoing what we've said here on this show many, many times. And, and I think a, a sound argument there. Like, if you're going to get some improvement from this roster, 
you're going to have to get it from the players already on this roster. Like no player, even Harrison Barnes, Miles Turner, or anybody else is going to come and save this franchise. It's still going to be guided based on the performances of Lowry taking that leap to the player he was, Victor Oladipo taking that leap, especially if he can continue to come off the bench and be a, a high impact, uh, you know, just six man player, uh, just a great factor out on the floor defensively and offensively back to the point. I mean, what, like, what's a great year for all the people just thinking off the top of my head like where where this is kind of quick here but what, what, what would you see as a great year for all the that takes um, him to that i don't next know about level. the stats but like if that jump shot uh comes back that's what i, I want know, the jump shot that's comes good. back he's yeah, shooting what's, what's the stat? Uh, like 36 37 from three something in that range he's slashing he looks good to me i said this uh on an, on a recent show yeah. like if he could just be miami's version of Andre Iguodala, like when when he was a sixth man for Golden State, Ooh. you know, I I think that's probably best case scenario for Victor Oladipo. And by the way, you could debate whether or not Iguodala should have won Finals MVP, but he did, right? Like he was a super important player for that like 2016 2017 era Golden State Warriors dynasty team. And so, if Oladipo could be something like that for Miami, I think that's the best case scenario and a super useful player. Uh, fifteen and what four? Fifteen oh. and four assists per yeah. game. That's what I was going. I'm oh, going with that. Yeah. All right, well, we'll talk a little bit about that Donovan Mitchell introductory press conference and some interesting comments he had to say about where he thought he was headed here in the next segment. But before we do that, just a reminder that betonline.net is still your number one source for all your pro and college football betting needs and sports info this season. You can find all the latest on football league developments. Why would they just call it the NFL? Uh, game matchups, news, and podcasts, including this year's opening week's games. Bet Online. Is also your continued source for all your sporting wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. Interesting comments from uh, Tua out of Dolphins training camp, or Media. not? Yeah, I guess training camp. Uh, yeah. Dolphin headquarters. Yeah, about him being somewhat undersized there. What, what, do, you, what do you think about it that? It is as funny a, that he says, "I Dolphins can't see fan. anybody out there." You would hope that your quarterback can see the other players on the field, but uh, not exactly news. Being either. mocked a little bit for that, from what I could see yeah, online. Whatever. Sorry. This is yeah. why athletes aren't honest is because they say something honest and then you start panning them. Even though everybody knows it's obvious to a six one, he doesn't see over the offensive line. It's something we all know. And then you make fun of right. him for saying something honest. This is why athletes aren't honest. Stop making fun of him. Is he six one like NBA six one from a few years ago? Oh, I no, I think he's like, I, don't I don't know. I think he might be. Uh, yeah, he might be like a he might be a Chris Paul six one. Who knows? Six one in shoes. Yeah. Uh, the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite sports and events, including Major League Baseball, boxing and golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn about the trends in action. Bet online where the game starts. Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, LeBron James, Giannis Antetokounmpo. Which NBA player moves the betting line the most this season? Locked on. And the Bet Online odds makers present the NBA top 50 most valuable players Starting next Monday, September 19th, you can find it on Locked on NBA wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. Again, very interesting list there with a couple of heat names on there. I'm sure you can figure out who, but where they rank on that list is going to be an interesting debate, and we'll have that for you as well next week. But uh, this episode, this segment right now, we'll be talking about another player on that list, one of the top 50 most valuable players. A guy who unfortunately was traded to the Cleveland Cavaliers. And yesterday he made his introductory press conference in Cleveland. Of course, we're talking about Donovan Mitchell, uh, who had this to say, some interesting comments about the trade scenario and everything else that was happening. Of course, Miami linked to Utah at one point. The New York Knicks seemed like they were the favorite. And it seemed like they might have been the favorite for Mitchell as well, who went on to say, quote, who doesn't want to be home next to their mom? I haven't lived at home since I was in the eighth grade. And I went to boring school, so it would have been nice. Once Rudy got traded, I kind of saw the writing in the wall. I think we all did. I kind of had the feeling I was going to get moved. And like I said, I thought it was going to be New York. So Donovan Mitchell talking about likely going to the New York Knicks and maybe even indicating that the Knicks were his preference. If for nothing else, just the opportunity mm -hmm. to go back home and spend some time with his uh, family there. So was Miami ever really – an? option for donovan mitchell like you know obviously mitchell never indicating that he demanded a trade or anything like that i think we, we that's been pretty clearly established uh he had no control of where he was going and it was up to danny ainge and the utah jazz to figure out where they were going to get mitchell and what they were going to get back for him that trade consummated already so now it's finalized but it seemed like miami was an option until really they weren't 
And now it seems like Mitchell, I don't know if he ever actually had any interest in coming to Miami and kind of piggybacking off of what we were talking about in the first segment, like maybe Miami no longer the destination uh, team that they once were. Maybe they're not the, the, you know, the, the destination franchise for a lot of superstar players. Like they've whiffed on Durant. Well, I, I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't go that another far just because there. it didn't really seem like Brooklyn was ever going to trade Kevin Durant. They were asking for every draft sure. pick on the planet in order to get to part with Kevin Durant. That doesn't <laughs> seem like it ever was going to happen. And then in terms of Donovan Mitchell, yeah, he didn't request a trade. We know that. Danny Ainge wanted to blow it up. He traded Rudy Gobert and then he wanted to trade Donovan Mitchell because he wanted to do an appropriate tank. Right, you're still going to be kind of good if if you have Donovan Mitchell on your team, and they're going for, um, you know, one of the top two picks in this loaded draft class coming up. So, um, look, I don't know that this is any. I don't think that this means that the Heat are not a destination anymore. We heard that when Kevin Durant wanted to try to get traded, he demanded a trade. That it was Phoenix yeah. and Miami that he was looking at. Right, he named two teams: Phoenix, who had by ten games. I know we all talk about how they flamed out and how disappointing it was, but they were still the best team in the league last year by 10 games. I mean, like nobody could touch them in the regular season. They're a loaded team. It makes sense why he might want to go there. And then obviously the vicinity to Hollywood and his production company and all that kind of stuff. And then obviously Miami, he picked Miami. And uh, I, so I do think that players do want to play for Miami. I just don't know that um, the heat ever really had a chance at Donovan Mitchell because look, you and I have talked about this. It, it was the belief around everybody who knew anything about what was going down with, down with Donovan Mitchell was that it was a matter of when, not if, Donovan Mitchell ended up in New York City. And then Cleveland comes in, out of, in whatever, talks break down between the Knicks and the Jazz. Cleveland comes out of nowhere and gets Donovan Mitchell. Now, I got to believe if somebody is thorough and careful with trades, as Danny Ainge is, that he at least called other teams. Now, I don't know if other teams include Miami or not. I don't know if Danny Ainge would do business with Pat Riley in that way. I don't know why he wouldn't if he's trying to tank and not trying to yeah. win. But I I just think that right now, to me, what this means is that the Heat never really had a chance, Donovan Mitchell, because as soon as those talks broke down with the Knicks and it opened the door for Cleveland to come in, we did this already on the show, David. Like You look like dollar for dollar, asset for asset that Cleveland offered Utah you could make a pretty strong argument that Miami could have at least matched that offer. And we have no indication that they were even close to getting down of a Mitchell. Whereas Cleveland with a similar offer that Miami could, could put together got Donovan Mitchell. Right. And so I just wonder if this is more of other teams looking at the assets that the heat have and not being all that interested, whether that team might be out on Tyler hero, right? That could certainly be part of it. Or they just look at the draft picks Miami has and says, you know what? You're going to be picking in the 20s from now until the end of time. We're just not all that interested in it because you're never going to tank because that's just not what you do. And I've heard that. You know, you talk to people around the NBA and they're like, yeah, heat draft picks are not really worth that much because at the end of the day, you know, even if your team is garbage and it's just Dion Waiters and James Johnson's all over the roster, you're still going to win 40 games, right? And so it's just, it's not really something that they want. Uh, in re even when you look at a team like Cleveland with such a bright future, I think front offices are like, you know what? We'll kind of take the Cleveland picks over the Miami picks. We're not all that interested mm -hmm. in the Miami picks. I don't know. It just it makes me question Miami's asset base. Can they really match it? Is is there much value in there at all? That's my question. Uh, first of all, I can't believe besmirching Dion Waiters and James Johnson. If you want to throw Luke Babbitt under that bus, that's fine. I mean, that, I do it I mean, too much. I was trying to pick on somebody new. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. I think Derek Williams. I mean, I guess there you go, fair. Derek Williams. Uh, I'm I'm also. Curious, like, does this mean that Miami wouldn't be a destination for Mitchell? Like, already I think Cavaliers fans expect that there, there's going to be a challenge retaining Mitchell once his contract ends in three years. Like, that's three years. But you know what? Three years yeah. ends relatively quickly in NBA terms. Uh, when he finally, when that contract ends, will he resign in Cleveland? They've got to make decisions on Darius Garland. Obviously, they're going to have to pay him a lot of money. Evan well, Mobley also, they're going to have to pay him a lot of money. Uh, Jared Allen, et cetera. So does that mean that they're out and they're running for well, Donovan all, Mitchell for the three Cavaliers, years down you don't the road make this well? deal unless you're willing to pay all four of those guys, you know, three years from now. But to your point, yeah. like Donovan Mitchell, well, you don't. Like if you, well, you're going to trade all these draft picks, you're going to pay all these guys. You're expecting that all these guys are going to get max contracts. And Dan Gilbert will do it. But um, if you're Miami, come on. Like are we really talking about three years from now? Like... <laughs> Come on, man. Like, if that's what it just kind of goes back to the hope, like, can we just not do this? 
It's like maybe three years from now, Donovan Mitchell is available, but we're not talking. Like, I love Donovan Mitchell. We're not talking about LeBron and Chris Bosh and Dwayne Wade and Amari Stoudemire and all these guys in 2010. We're talking about a good player in Donovan Mitchell who's, if what, it moves up and to him based on years, his comments, will probably end now. up in New York. What? Two, two and a half years from now. Like, two he's in the last year of that contract. Yeah, whatever, they haven't maybe. won a lot. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. maybe well, you try just saying, just, Tyler I'll, Hero I'll just, and something else. But, like, that, you do that in two years, man. Like, that's not what you're – you're not planning on it. You can't plan on it. It just seems if it, if it happens, it happens. We know Donovan Mitchell loves Bam Adebayo. They want to play with each other during uh, – they, they were playing a bunch of pickup games during the, the Miami Pro-Am and stuff. But guess what? They could do that forever. They could do that their entire careers. They could just play together at Pro-Ams and have a great time every single summer. Maybe that's enough. Maybe they don't have to play on the same NBA team. I think we put a little too much emphasis on that kind of thing. It sounds like if Donovan Mitchell has his pick of where he's going to go, he's going to end up in New York. Based on these comments, he wants to end up back in New York City. Yeah, I'd have to agree on that. But, uh, you know, we'll move on. We'll talk a little bit about the latest in the investigation regarding the acquisition of P.J. Tucker by the Philadelphia 76ers and Miami's role in that investigation here on Locked on Heat. Thanks so much for making Locked on Heat your first listen every day. Of course, make sure to subscribe to the show, leave comments, feedback on YouTube. You can always reach out to us via email at LockedOnHeat at gmail.com. You can always reach out to us via Twitter as well. If you've got questions about upcoming Miami Heat media day or training camp, we want to hear from you. We'll be talking to those players. And you know what? Send in your questions. Maybe we'll ask them directly. You never know. So the only way to do that is by leaving comments and reaching out to us however you can. But right now, we're going to wrap up today's show with the latest from Adam Silver, NBA commissioner, regarding the Philadelphia 76ers and their acquisition of P.J. Tucker Silver uh, on somewhat of a hot seat as he's addressing the latest regarding the Robert Sarver uh, ruling, uh, the punishment, if you want to even call it that, from the NBA regarding his horrific behavior over the last few years there. Um, and in the course of that, also being asked about P.J. Tucker and Philadelphia 76ers and the investigation there. And his quote is, the statuses of those investigations are ongoing. Hopefully, They'll be wrapped up in the next few weeks. I think what prompted them was sort of just the TikTok chronology around sort of when signings are permissible and the announcements of those signings and the information that came out about them, which was cause for the league office to investigate. So out of this, I think the clear indicator is that, as a lot of fans have indicated, uh, Miami did not wind up ratting out the Philadelphia 76ers. They did not cry to Adam Silver. This is not something that this heat front office would do. And I I know that you're pretty happy about that. Typically, the way that these things work, just for a little bit of background, is when the league office initiates a tampering investigation, the way that the heat were hit with a tampering investigation for the the sign and trade with Kyle Lowry that last summer is the A team, at least one team in the NBA, has to basically complain, has to say something uh, to initiate that investigation with the front with the NBA's front office, and so that's typically how this works. But basically, Adam Silver and look, we all saw the right the, the reporting on PJ Tucker. I mean, weeks in advance of the the moratorium and NBA free agency opening up, we were all like, oh yeah, PJ Tucker's going to Philadelphia. So Adam Silver reads this stuff too. He sees it. He's like, okay, this is clearly tampering, and so he himself initiated that. Now, what I love about this is unlike a year ago where you had, we don't know exactly what teams complained about Miami getting Kyle Lowry, but based Cuban. on stuff we're hearing, it's, it sounds like it was probably Dallas or New Orleans or one of these other teams that were hoping to get Kyle Lowry. And of course, Miami ended up getting him. Um, he don't snitch though, man. They don't snitch. They didn't get, they didn't, they weren't able to retain PJ Tucker. PJ Tucker was sold on the Philadelphia 76ers. We have talked about how that is a tough hit on this heat roster. They would have loved to have PJ Tucker back. They sung his praises at the end of the season hoping, yeah. wishing, having having Jimmy Butler and Kyle Lowry and all these guys actively recruiting him over the summer. Please, PJ, come back. They tried to get him back, but they didn't get him back. It was already worked out with Philadelphia. And you know what? The Heat just moved on because they don't snitch. The Heat don't snitch. You know who does snitch? Every other team in the NBA, but the Heat don't snitch. What about every other team? but certainly Every not other Riley. team, David, especially right. Danny Ainge. I don't know. I'm making no, it yeah, yeah that, that I could totally say. Like, <laughs> Danny Danny Age is whining and crying. He's got Adam Silver on speed dial, I'm sure. Um, Pat Riley, he, he he uses the system too much. He knows what it's like. He's never going to complain about another team doing it. But if another team wanted to up him, 
I think he's just too honest and open yeah. about all that, where he's not going to be like, oh, you know what? They stole P.J. Tucker. I'm really pissed off now. I'm going to go cry about it. That's yeah. just not his Even style. though they steal players. It, it is sort of like a flopper complaining about another player flopping. That would kind of be what it, if Pat Riley complains about another team tampering. Yeah, it's, it's like, the Spider-Man meme in, in real life right. and NBA front offices. Yeah, so I don't I don't see that being a realistic possibility there. But uh, you know, also the difference between the Kyle Lowry thing, I think we, we've seen is that Obviously, that was a much more complicated sign and trade scenario there. So the fact that it was finalized at six o'clock at the trade de- or the this, the deadline for NBA free agency, that I think was what brought the suspicions to the NBA league offices a little bit. So uh, anyway, it's over now. PJ Tucker is seventy sixers. If they slap a punishment on them, who cares? They're still not getting beat. They're still not getting past Miami. Miami's still the better team. I, you don't right? want me to respond to that. Yes, I do. I do. I think I think you agree. On, I think on you paper, got... on paper, Philadelphia is a better team. But you know what? If it was in the playoffs, I just games aren't played on paper, baby. <laughs> They're true. played on the hardwood. It's and true. you know what? Miami has the experience. Joel Flopper and Bead, James Flopper, Harden. They can't get past that. PJ Tucker finally brings some toughness to the Sixers, but he's 105 years old. He's not going to be much of a factor there. It's I fine. appreciate your optimism. <laughs> That's right. Heat and five, baby. That's the way it works out. Anyway, thanks so much for making Lockdown Heat your first listen every day. For your second listens, get up today on the latest news and rumors in the NBA in just 30 minutes every day with Locked On NBA. Locked On NBA, your daily NBA update in just 30 minutes. This is David Ramil signing off for now. Thanks so much for joining me, Wes. Subscribe, like, ring the bell here on YouTube.